Hey guys, what's going on? Today I'll be doing um, the life of William Shakespeare and the theatre at that time, how it was. I got a lot of questions from students asking me about how the life of William Shakespeare was, what did he do, how did he come up to be, to be who he really is, who he was, you know, at that time, the famous playwright. Um, theatre-wise, as in, who was which one is better? Is it now? Is it before? How different is it? Um, all that. So I'll be covering that during this video. I hope you guys benefit. Um, and if you do, please do not forget to like and subscribe. So, um, the beginning, the way it was uh, in terms of William Shakespeare, and what I want to discuss first is his life. Um, of course, one of the most famous artists to have ever existed or lived and these writings have been used in all of English language itself in all, whether it's the Leaving Search you're doing or the O levels, A levels, IB, anything you will definitely know who Shakespeare is and would have at least read one play in your lifetime about him um, not about him, but like one that he created um, we don't know much about his life, but what I could tell you is that he was born in a place called Stratford-upon-Avon in a place called Warwickshire in 1564. Now, the precise date of birth of William Shakespeare is not really known to the public, but people have been thinking and have come up with like, you know, a norm to celebrate his birthday on the 23rd of April. It's like they have accepted this to be his birthday worldwide. Um, for information, this is also the feast of St. George, England's patron saint, all right? So, Shakespeare's father's name was John, and he was a glover, a person who, you know, manufactures the gloves. He was also a leather merchant, and his mother's name was Mary Arden, uh, who was the daughter of the well-known wealthy Robert Arden of Wilmcote, who owned a 60-acre farm. So the house in Stratford where Shakespeare grew up has been preserved and, to your surprise, is open today to visitors, all right? So you can actually go out and check out his life, his, um, this, this house, this, this magnificent house that he was, you know, raised at. So um, probably begin, Shakespeare probably began his education the age of like around six or seven, that's what people have been assuming at a place called King's New School, obviously in Stratford, because that's where he lived. Like all grammar schools, the focus would have been very much on Latin, poetry, drama, history, and everything else, and that's very much completely normal. Now, when Shakespeare got to the age of 18, and all that gap between, don't really know much about, but when he reached 18 years of age, he married a woman called Anne Hathaway. Um, who was 26 for your information and already had was several months pregnant which is very much you know wouldn't say weird but unusual um, William Shakespeare's first child Susanna was baptized in Stratford sometime around May 1583 and of course baptism records reveal that twins Hannet and Judith were born in February 1585 and Hamlet, William's only son, died in 1596, and he was only uh, 11 years old, I reckon. So we don't really know the cause of death, uh, at least I don't. And the years between 1585 and the year uh, 1592 are often referred to the, um, Shakespeare's lost years, lost years, because we almost know nothing about these years during this, this period, and legends and tall tales, all you know, people always tell tales and, and legends about what he used to do at those times and what he did. Uh, they used to, people say that he worked as a schoolmaster, some say that he had to flee Stratford for London because he was caught poaching the nobleman's deer, what? Uh, that he worked in his father's glove business and many other rumors, and we don't know exactly what, what it was like or what he did, all right? Um, However, we could say that it's likely that he spent some of these years in theatrical circles and this is where he actually learned to, to master the art of playwright, playwriting and, and in creating all these you know, famous plays that he you know, created. And we, are, we would assume that these lost years, so-called, have been you know, lived at that time doing exactly that, learning how to produce 
basically uh, improving his dramatical skills uh, writing plays and all that now what we're certain about is that by 1592 Shakespeare was established as a well-known playwright okay and this is where he you know he, he surfaced to the world and his work was growing in popularity on the London stage so his rise towards fame was technically steady and by 1594 um, he was part owner of a theater company and that theater company uh, was basically known as the Lord Chamberlain's Men which would exclusively stage, you guessed it, Shakespeare's historical plays or and uh, Chamberlain's historical plays as well as the tragedies and the comedies and the focus was mainly some people say that the only thing is staged was Lord Chamberlain's uh, men like the, 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 the historical plays of his of himself not Shakespeare's but um, I've researched and I've seen that that there are also a lot of people that argue I mean when I say people I mean scholars that argue that a lot of Shakespeare's plays were also staged there like pre-stage I would say in 1599, the company took the unusual step of purchasing their own theater premises and the Globe on the south bank of the River Thames. Now, 1599 also began a phase of remarkable productivity for Shakespeare. Um, remark these this year, 1599. And over the next few years, he wrote a whole string of classic dramas such as Hamlet and Macbeth and Julius Caesar and King Lear and, you know, many more. These plays proved immensely popular both with in terms of like in terms of like with literally specialists and with the general audience like you and I. So much so in uh, 19 in 1604 Shakespeare's company received the blessing of King James himself and from then on uh, were known as the Kingsmen. So Success, of course, just like all of us, made Shakespeare a very much wealthy man. Um, and in 1597, he purchased New Place, which is the largest second house in Stratford Town. He also owned several properties all over. So, however, some sources indicate that throughout this period, Shakespeare continued to act at least periodically, appearing in both his own and in other playwrights' works. Now, we could argue, fairly argue, that it seems um, that Shakespeare had long divided his time between two places, London and Stratford, and according to tradition, retired some years before his death. Now, he still retained interests and in property in London, uh, but after 1613, we are thinking that he, like, we assume that he wrote almost nothing. Uh, he died on the 23rd of April, 1616, and this is well known to everyone, at the age of 52. Pretty much kind of young for that time. Now, um, if I'm talking about the theatre at that time and how it was for, you know, like, all around for, for the people, how what was it different than, than what we see today? We go to the theatre, is it different than, than this or how similar was it? So attending a play at that time, and we call it the Shakespearean time, um, in my opinion, I would say it was very much different. Yes, the concept is the same. You go, you sit, you watch. But the distribution of separation, for instance, of, of people, who sat where, and it was all, like, to a certain extent, based on ranking, like, genre played a major role in terms of, like, you know, what kind of play is being, is being played. Um... Even, even uh, most importantly, men and, men and women couldn't really sit at one place. Um, or it was also a little bit racist in terms of that, but let me get into detail. Um, today's audiences, of course, are expected to be silent and, and, and respectful in terms of uh, you know, the audience and the performance. Like if you, if you go, like, just like the movies, if you go to the movies, you're expected to be silent and, and you know, not, not to you know, comment out loud or anything. But however, in Shakespearean time, um, the audience was noisy and had little reservation 
about expressing your response to the action unfolding before it. So they people like would literally throw stuff at you if you didn't act properly or if there was an error or if they didn't like a scene, they would make sure you got them well know that they don't like that scene. It's either by throwing tomatoes at you if you're really bad or by booing or by, you know, these kind of signals. So that's like the first difference that I would want to, you know, put out there. Um, now, the most common way for this to happen was for the crowd to shout M-E-W, Mew, the origins of the contemporary expression of cat call, meow, literally, which is, you know, hilarious. Me recording this is even way funnier. Um, now, eating and drinking during plays was, of course, very popular, and we still do that till today. There are, like, but what's different is that now we like, grab, like, you know, our chocolate bar, or Coke, whatever it is, but back then we would see, like, sellers of oranges, apples, nuts circulate around the audience as the play performed, selling stuff to them, which is, in my opinion, very much cool. Indeed, throwing fruit at the stage was another way for the audience to express his disapproval. So not only tomatoes, like, you would just throw a banana or something like that. That, that's, that was completely fine. You wouldn't be fined, jailed kicked out, nothing. Um, also, tobacco and beer were freely available all over. Now I think alcohol, for instance, is forbidden to be taken into theaters, at least for the ones that I've been to. Now, the opening of the theater was signaled by the blowing of a trumpet and the flying of a flag on the roof of the theater to let the people know that, that the doors were open. A small orchestra would play three flourishes to signal the beginning of the play itself. Now this, of course, we no longer have anymore unless you're really visiting a historical play or, uh, you know, a play that, that kind of like, you know, plays by the old rules. And plays would mostly in winter start around 2 o'clock and around 3 o'clock during the summer, which is very, I mean, they had like strict times of starting plays. Now, a play typically lasted anywhere from around, like, let's say, two to like four hours. And when we read a play by Shakespeare, we see, of course, that the work is divided into uh, acts, scenes. Uh, but this is an invention by the editors, to your surprise. Like, this wasn't there when Shakespeare actually wrote the play. He wouldn't, like, come up with act one, scene one today, and then go to bed and like in seven days come up with act one, scene two. No, they would just write. So keep that in mind. Not only Shakespeare, but anyone at that time. Um, the plays were originally like acted straight through without any obvious scene breaks. Like, there were no breaks, all right? And there were no intervals between acts. Now, it's important to know that in Shakespeare's time, there were no female actors. This is very important. If you're doing a paper on this, you gotta mention this. It was illegal for a woman to appear on stage, and such activity being considered highly improper and appropriate for the fairer sex. So instead, the female parts were played by boys and young men who haven't really reached, you know, age of, uh, uh, like, maturity, and still have, like, these, uh, I would say, softer sounds, all right, uh, voices. So now what I want to talk about, I want to talk about the, the Globe, the Globe Theater. Majority, maybe all, not all, but like almost all of Shakespeare's most famous plays were performed in the Globe. Um, that is built on the south bank of the Thames around 1598. Now, this was made of timber with a thatched roof in the shape of a polygon. And it was roughly 100 feet wide and could hold up to around 3,500 people. So 3,500, not more. The stage in the globe was only a meter or so off the ground, so it's kind of accessible to the audience if they really want to like cause issues, big problems. It was surrounded on three sides by the audience. So literally it was like a, you know, like a, you can Google images about this, but I'm just gonna explain it to you real quick. So it's like a, you know, the stage, and then people will be here, here, and here, and watching the stage from the sides and from the front. Now, <clears throat> there was a trap door in the middle of the stage that led down to the underworld, all right? A space where ghosts and other supernatural characters could make a dramatic appearance during the play. Think of, um, uh, for instance, Hamlet's ghost when it appears. Like, that is very much impressive. At that time, it would appear, like, right from the middle of the 
the uh, theater. Now, the stage. And what I really want to tell you is people wouldn't be impressed by that now, but they were back then. Even though they saw it, they would still be, they, they would know how it works. Like the guy came up right from the middle of the ground. We see the hatch being open, the, the, the ghost coming out. They would know that, but they would still be amazed by the act. Now it would just be like, whatever. Because we have all the CGI effects, I'm talking about like movie effects and like the, the fantasy and the thrillers and the acting. And so we don't really wouldn't be interested in seeing that. <coughs> I mean, we would all be interested for, for, for the historical part, but we wouldn't be amused. Maybe that's a way be better way to say it. Now, above the stage was the musician's gallery which was also to, used to represent walls and balconies and on either side of the gallery were the Lord's Rooms which were used as viewing points reserved exclusively for noblemen and women. Now stage sets were minimal to non-existent with, er, with only a few props used to evoke various locations. Now the audience had to be willing to suspend disbelief and use their imagination to create the play's setting in their mind's eye. Now, if a play is being performed, people put in much actors, players, as Shakespeare calls them, called them, would put in much more effort into you know providing us with like uh, like like rain or 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 like people actually like splash rain on you for the heck of it, or pour, pour rain down, for just to feel the moment. But back then you would like have to imagine this. Um, for instance, at that time, if a scene was at night, for example, or in the desert or in a forest, only the actor's words could convey this, unlike now, how they would actually perform it at night, if it was night. Or if it's desert, they would actually try to put sand, or, or maybe a wallpaper with like a picture of a sand, you know, like, that's what they would do. Now, although the stage always looked the same, a great deal of importance was placed on elaborate costumes and makeup, and choreographed fight scenes were popular with audiences, with the blood and organs of sheep and pigs used as a primitive special effect. You know, it's very much interesting. Why pigs and why sheep? Now, in 1613, the globe was completely destroyed by fire. This is so important. When a cannon shot during a performance of Henry VII I, set fire to the thatched roof. Now, a modern reconstruction of the globe, located approximately 750 meters from the site of the original, was opened in 1997 and is today a major London tourist attraction. So, in terms of the Shakespearean plays um, and like his life and how the theater was different at that time and how it's you know how it's way different now and the similarities and all that I think I've covered basically the majority of these things uh, if I've missed something then please feel free to comment down below or let me know and I'll cover it for you or re-explain if I have to Thank you guys very much for watching. If you have any questions, let me know, email me, or just, you know, place them down in the comments below. Thank you, and have a good day.